Marvel is full of all kinds of teams, both good and bad, extraordinary and subtle, popular and not so popular. Today I think it's high time we shine a spotlight on our favorite teams of losers and rebels who should be treated better. Now, when we say that these teams deserve better, there really isn't a better example than the Harvesters. After the events of the Superhuman Civil War, Iron Man created the 50 State Initiative. This was essentially an initiative to set up government funded superhero teams throughout each of the United States. Some of these teams were already established groups of heroes, but for some states, completely new groups composed of local heroes were formed. The Sunflower State, Kansas, gained its team in the form of the Harvesters. This new new team was made up of pretty strange heroes that we hadn't seen before. Topeka, who led the team, was basically just a super soldier. Then there was Pioneer, who had the power of the planes, as she put it. Sunflower, who was literally a human sunflower who got stronger under direct sunlight and appeared to have a high degree of durability. There was Meadowlark, who could fly and sing to hypnotize people. And then, of course, there was Grain Belt, whose body was literally made of grain that he could control. Why did they deserve better? Well, this this team's only claim to fame came when they faced off against a zombie clone of the hero Hyperion, who is basically the Marvel equivalent of Superman, and he utterly destroyed each member of this team. They did not stand a single chance. Only Pioneer just barely made it out alive by raising up an entire herd of undead cattle and trampling the zombie Hyperion, who then succumbed to mad cow disease, and I wish I made that up. Now most of you nerds have heard about the Skrulls. This alien race has been a nuisance in Marvel Comics ever since their first appearance in Fantastic Four number two. The Skrull members who fought the Four at this time ended up hypnotized into believing they were actually cows by Reed Richards and they shapeshifted into and were stuck as cows. What I'm sure Reed did not anticipate is that these Skrull cows ended up finding themselves in a butcher and turned into beef. This Skrull beef was then consumed by regular old Earthlings. Now, while a good majority of people did not survive the Skrull cow meat, a select few did, and had the Skrull's adaptable DNA code transferred into their human cells, resulting in a condition called Skrullivoria induced Skrullophobia. The infected individuals gained the ability to shapeshift like a Skrull, but also developed an intense irrational fear and hatred of the Skrull. And they came together to form the aptly named Skrull Kill Crew. Fueled by their irrational impulse, to destroy the Skrull. They helped prevent the Skrulls from attacking other people, but they even faced off against other villains like Baron Von Strucker. It's just a really unfortunate way to gain a superpower. Now, X-Force is the awesome Black Ops X-Men related team with characters like Domino and Cable and Cannonball and Wolverine and Warpath, and it's awesome. But for a short little while, it was decidedly not awesome. In the year 2000, X-Force got canceled and rebranded into what eventually would become X-Statics. This team isn't exactly one of the premier mutant teams in the world, and that's putting it lightly. The original team was made up of the mutants Zeitgeist, who has the power of Super Puke, La Nui with Dark Force powers, Battering Ram, who was a big purple goat looking man, Plasm, who had liquidy water powers, Jin Genie, who could create earthquakes depending on how much she drank, and Sluck, who was basically a squid man. But all of those original members, minus three of them who I didn't mention, and Sluck, who was blown up by a tank in South Africa, all got completely desperate decimated in spectacularly embarrassing fashion during a rescue mission to save a pop music boy band named Boys Are Us. Turns out their demise was actually planned by the team's manager, coach, and its leader, Zeitgeist, because they thought a team with a constantly changing roster and high body count would gain them fan interest. The team managed to go on with pretty horrible results. There have been 28 members of Ecstatics who have passed away over their history with only 9 surviving. 9. Okay, so we we have X-Statics, we have X-Force, we have the X-Men of course, and we have a whole handful of other X-branded teams, but some mutants aren't considered presentable to the outside world because whatever their mutation is, it has been deemed either gross or terrifying by the wider Marvel human society, or they are mutants who are just bitter about being persecuted for being mutants. This group banded together, named themselves the Morlocks, and headed down into the Morlock tunnels beneath New York City. Already without anything happening to them other than their mutants, Mutations, these characters have it rough and deserve better. But then, to add flame to the fire, the Morlocks undergo tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, with one of the worst being the event known as the Mutant Mass. 
Reaper, where Mr. Sinister and the mutant Gambit put together a group of villainous characters and led them into the tunnels to commit, well, a massacre. And it was all because another villain, Dark Beast, created some of these Morlocks and Mr. Sinister didn't like that. Sometimes it takes the smallest of things to bring people together. And while that may sound like an extremely beautiful sentiment, I'm saying it in relation to the villainous team known as the Headmen, who it seems came together because each of their powers revolves around their heads in one way or another. And it's honestly kind of unsettling in my opinion. Putting their heads together, figuratively, not literally, these scientists sought out world domination, bringing them into conflict with the Defenders, She-Hulk, and Spider-Man. The quartet consisted of Arthur Nagin, their leader who had his head transplanted onto the body of a gorilla, Ruby Thursday who replaced her own head with an organic computer capable of changing shape, Gerald Morgan aka Shrunken Bones who accidentally shrank his own skeleton including his skull so he basically just had really baggy skin, and Chandu the Mystic's head had been transplanted by Nagin onto a number of different bodies throughout his time making him quite the versatile little guy. Not gonna lie. The champions of Los Angeles were the first West Coast based superhuman team. They formed like all great superhero teams do with several heroes happening to just meet by chance against a great threat. In this case, that threat took the form of the Greek god of death, Pluto. The group consisted of two former X-Men, Angel and Iceman, the Greek god of strength, Hercules, who I swear is super underappreciated, Johnny Blaze, the original Ghost Rider, and the Russian spy Black Widow, who led the team. After defeating Pluto, the champions of Los Angeles, or just the champions, decided to stick together as a team. Warren Worthington III, aka Angel, was the wealth behind the group, and with his money, they bought their own Quinjet and named it the Champ Jet, which I find hilarious, because over time, the members of this team started to become embarrassed by the entire idea of the team as a whole. Both Iceman and Angel called it an embarrassment and a nightmare because they had no idea what they were doing. But still, they had a few more adventures working with X-Force, and they had some additions to the roster with Black Goliath, who aided the team in a scientific aspect, and another Russian female hero, Darkstar, who was originally there to capture Black Widow, but ended up changing sides instead. I'm gonna be honest, I kinda love the lineup of this team, I'd read it if they came back. Now you remember how the headmen all came together based on their head related powers? Well I'll do you one better. How about the Death Throws, whose powers and names all have something to do with commonly throwing stuff. The leader, ringleader, threw together teammates Bombshell, Knickknack, Oddball, Tenpin, and Throwdown into a group that honestly works really well together, juggling their various different throwing instruments between each other. They worked so well together in fact that they were even hired to and succeeded in breaking the villain Crossfire out of prison. However, once they had taken Crossfire to their HQ, they discovered that Crossfire was broke. His assets had all been impounded and he had lost all of his useful connections. These guys did battle with characters like Captain America, Crossfire, Hawkeye, and even Loki of all people who stopped the group from robbing the big top casino in Las Vegas. Their Marvel wiki even lists their origins as, and I quote, a joint effort to perform criminal and mercenary acts while using juggling expertise. I honestly can't even believe this group of villains exists and that they haven't been able to get bullseye into their ranks. What the heck's up with that? Okay, of all the teams on this list, I think that Horticulture may be my favorite. For starters, they look so cool, but then you find out that it's actually just a bunch of older women between the ages of 64 to 81 who are all expert botanists and want to bring Earth back to a more pristine time when it had about 7 billion less people on it and it was ruled by plant life. I just love how they use their regular names and the names just kind of suit their ages and interests in plants. We got Augusta Bromes, Lily Lamus, Edith Scutch, and Opal Vetiver. Gosh! What a bunch of winners. But yes, that's right, these ladies want to basically exterminate most of the Earth's human population and bring plants back to the forefront, specifically flowers. This goal brings them into conflict with the X-Men in 2019's X-Men number three. Beyond biological modifications believed to have been made to themselves, the women of horticulture are experts at manipulating the environment to suit their extinction agenda, and they're also computer programmers selling software to Orcus to monitor Krakoan gateways. They did get pretty handily walloped though, so hmm. Second to last, as part of kid-centric star comics, Marvel decided to release a team composed of 
animal superheroes, which is cool. But the difference here is this team of animal heroes were cybernetically enhanced super intelligent animals with absolutely massive arsenals and awesome exoskeletons, which is much cooler. And they fought for the environment, which is even cooler cooler. This team was made up of Boomer, a kangaroo, Lionheart, a lion, Soar slash Slipstream, an eagle, Reckless, who was a bear, and Dr. Echo slash Surfstreak, who was a dolphin. Does it sound kind of ridiculous? Sure, but it is awesome. This team was co-created by Multicore, spearheaded by Dr. Randall Pierce, and it was all part of Weapons 2, which itself was the second project after Weapon 1. Who would have thought? Also known as Project Rebirth, also known as the project that created Captain America. Now some of you may know that these projects were part of a bigger thing called Weapons Plus, who would eventually go on to create Man-Thing, Luke Cage, Nuke, Typhoid Mary, Phantom X, the Stepford Cuckoos, and of course, Wolverine. So most people know that they aren't exactly a good group of people. While their original series was cancelled after only a few issues in Wolverine and Captain America Weapons Plus number one, those two heroes investigated an abandoned Weapons Plus site where they found the team kept in hibernation tanks full of liquid. The bear, Reckless, was freed from his container but attacked the duo resulting in his passing. And last up today, first ever introduced in 1989's West Coast Avengers Volume 2 number 46, the Great Lake Avengers formed after Mr. Immortal put out an ad in the local personals seeking men and women of action to join forces and form a team of super friends. This managed to catch the attention of Avengers members Hawkeye and Mockingbird. In order to help them out, the Great Lakes Avengers were trained by the duo and the rest was history. The team is made up of pretty much Z-list heroes with the main lineup usually consisting of Mr. Immortal, Doorman, Big Bertha, and Flatman. Naturally, as a sort of running joke throughout Marvel Comics since their introduction, the team goes up against some of the zaniest villains and situations I have ever seen, and they don't do particularly well. But I'll be darned if I don't have a soft spot for this team. The funny thing about most joke characters and teams is that they almost always end up actually doing some pretty extraordinary things from time to time. I can't think of any examples for the Great Lake Avengers, but I'm sure you guys can, and you can tell me about it in the comments below, because that is all the time I have left. Thank you guys so much for watching on Top 10 Nerd. I'm your host, Adam Andrews. I will catch you all in the flippy flop, but until then, make sure to stay safe and peace out, nerds.